The 90s was certainly a brilliant decade for cinema. It really, really was. So here's my top 25 favourite films from the 90s. Some of them I own. Uh, some I have lent to friends at the moment, so they're not here. But I will show the movies that I own in this top 25. So let's get started then. My first is going to have to be Barton Fink from the Coen Brothers. I think this is like my fa I think this is my favourite Coen Brothers film. It's not exactly the most popular choice for a favourite Coen Brothers film, but I just really enjoyed it as a psychological thriller and also kind of a dark comedy as well. John Goodman is just fantastic in this film. This is like 10 Cloverfield Lane level performance for John Goodman. This was, it was really good. And then number 24 it is a film that I only watched last week and all I know is I want to see it again and I can't wait to see it again. And it's The Double Life of Veronique by Christoph Kislowski who did Three Colors Trilogy and The Decalogue, that TV, massive TV series in Poland. Um, but it was it was an incredible film and I think it was the use of sound and silence that really drew me in. I don't quite understand everything I've seen but it was just so mesmerising and I know I enjoyed it. Fantastic work. Number 23 is another film I watched not too long ago and it was Thomas Vinterberg's The Celebration, also known as Festen. And wow, this is one of the Dog Me 95 films. Is it, I think it's 95 or Dog Me 45? I'm not sure, but it was a manifesto where filmmakers were given a set of rules. They did it amongst themselves. They had a set of rules of how to shoot a film, uh, non diegetic sound, non diegetic music. It has to be shot on very uh, small and cheap equipment. And, you know, in a way, it really is the ultimate middle finger to Hollywood industry and, you know, real film, uh, what would be considered conventional filmmaking where everything has to be done in a certain way, you know, production standards, broadcast qualities. It throws that out the window and just makes something of its own. And for some reason, I just love that gritty texture, that imperfection, because there's something so real about it and just so different looking about it, you know, that cheap quality, but in a very good way. You know, there's a difference between a shitty 80s B horror movie crap look than something like this, or even, you know, Dance in the Dark, that very low quality, that green, that video-like texture. It, there's just something, it's very hard to explain, but I, I just really like it. And in terms of the story, fantastic. Just really enjoy those performances. People really like, you know, they look like they're just gonna beat the shit out of each other every moment, moment to moment. Really tense drama. So that's it's one of the best dramas I've seen. In at 22 is a film I need to own on Blu-ray very soon, and it's The Nightmare Before Christmas. An absolute favourite of mine, one that really got me into movies quite early on. I still think it's one of the most vivid, imaginative, and you know, pretty original works that has ever happened in the animated world, because it just has such a unique texture and tone to it, uh, with being stop motion and everything, and the songs are wonderful. It's a brilliant universe, and I wish the film was longer in a way. You know, it is, it's very short before you know what the film's over, but magical, magical film. In at number 21 is a pretty experimental film, and it is Baraka. And there's also the new film that came out in a few years ago called Samsara, uh, from the same director, Ron, Ron Frick. And it's a pretty amazing work. It's just, there's no plot, and it's just pure montage uh, of nature and other things around the world. It's shot in like 25 different countries or something and it's got one of the most astonishing tones of any film I've ever seen. It's got some of the nicest cinematography I've ever seen. You imagine all those really nice shots that you see in a show like Planet Earth. It's, it's like that and it's just so beautiful. While it doesn't have any characters or story or plot, it does tell a kind of story. It has something that it's saying just through visual imagery. And I love that because it takes you right back to what was being done even in The Man with the Movie Camera way back in 1928. You know, trying to make this universal language just purely about visual, just about, just about the visual form. Um, so it's, it's, it's pure cinema in a way. It's all about the image. You know, um, but sound is used extremely well in the film. The music is spellbinding. And then, of course, we enter some of the cults. Beautiful, beautiful. I'd love to see... Uh, more films like this, definitely. Uh, Koyana Scotty is a really good one too, which came out in the 80s. It's also a really great montage type film. In at number 20 is the acclaimed Tarantino flick, Pulp Fiction. I should own this in Blu-ray too. 
you know, just having this cheap looking DVD. It's just something so cheap about DVDs now. I've became that snob. I'm really here to say that. Pulp Fiction, anyway, is, you know, it's a film that doesn't need that much discussion. It really isn't. It's, it was a, gr a fairly groundbreaking film. It had a very unique style to it. Its structure was not unprecedented, but certainly interesting to use in the 90s. And the kind of characters that it follows, because it, it just floats floats through the story and it's very funny and it's very just entertaining it's one of those films that's just purely entertaining while also having very great dramatic elements so yeah Pulp Fiction is a, a great choice and at number 19 is a Jim Jarmusch film which is my favorite Jim Jarmusch film at the moment and it's Night on Earth and this is a film that looks at I think it's five or six different countries and it's all about a different taxi driver so you've got all these different backgrounds and all these different characters getting into the taxis and it's purely about the characters that we meet in those taxis and it's a very interesting place for drama because what is a taxi it's somewhere that um people you know, people come and go you'll meet lots of different people and directions so it's a very great place to have, have drama and of course comedy you know roberto benini in this film is just hilarious he directed life is beautiful uh he's he's in all the jim Grimmish films as well but night on earth is definitely Definitely one to check out. Number 19, Race the Red Lantern, a fantastic film from Zhang Yimou. Uh, fantastic piece of Chinese cinema. One that I just can't wait to watch again. I, I need to own that one. I hope it. I don't think it has a Blu ray release yet in the UK or even the US, but I hope that changes soon. Hopefully, Masters of Cinema or something gets a hold of it. I know there's a criterion, actually. I think there's a criterion. And in at number 17, I hope I say 18 for Race the Red Lantern. In at number 17 is. A film set in Northern Ireland, in the name of the Father. It's terrific, absolutely terrific film. I was so impressed. <clears throat> I was so impressed with how good uh, Daniel Day Lewis done a Belfast accent. Holy shit, that man! It, now that I've seen most, I've seen pretty much all his films. Now I see why people uh, consider him just a god of acting because the accents he's done, I can't believe it. It's just. You see him in Gangs of New York, you see him in My Left Foot, where he plays an Irish person, uh, an Irish person with cerebral palsy. And then you see him in There Will Be Blood. This guy is a master of accents, and he really, really gets into the skin of the characters. And they're very different characters every time he plays them. And this is probably his most standout, uh, in terms of being different, you know, because it's not exactly, you know, a Belfast accent in the long, in all of cinema. It's not really an accent many actors that aren't from here try, and you don't see it on the screen that often, so it really is unique. And this is a, a great film capturing uh, someone who is, who was wrongly put in prison, um, of Jerry Conlon, and it's just a really engaging film. In at number 16 is Life is Sweet from Mike Lee, uh, whose filmography I've really dug into this year, and I absolutely love it. Life is Sweet, for me, is definitely one of his best. The performances... The story, the tone, I just absolutely loved it. And it just reeked of Britain. It was so British. I couldn't believe how British it was. It was... I just, I just can't believe how realistic his stories are and how down-to-earth it is. Because it really is looking at the sort of things. There's still, those little moments, those little social interactions that occur in British lifestyle. You know, f from put the kettle on, get him a cup of tea, biscuits, things like that. Little things. Little things that sound really silly and insignificant, but there, it's those little things that really make a culture unique. And to see Britain put on film in such a way is just astonishing. And then, of course, it goes beyond that. It goes to the language of how of certain uh, slang words that would be used, uh, colloquialisms, things like that. And I just loved the performances. Uh... It's so funny, it's really, really funny, and it's also very tragic at times. I, I was definitely in tears in some of the scenes when the emotion got high. But, wow, what a beautiful film. It was one of those ones that just slapped me on the face. I just watched it one night, and within 15 minutes, I was so absorbed. I just absolutely loved the characters. It was all about those characters. At number 15 is another great piece of Chinese cinema, and it's called To Live. And it's from Zhang Yimou also, and it's... And it's interesting when I think about To Live because it's got similarities to Shen Cage's Farewell My Concubine. This is like his version of Farewell My Concubine. It's not as long, but it's got the same kind of 50-year span and it covers 
uh, the Cultural Revolution and the changes that occurred in China during that time. And To Live is a brilliant, brilliant film, and it's a devastating watch in the sense that, you know, you're 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 impressed that the characters even have the the strength to carry on with everything that happens, and that really does tie into why it's called To Live, because it captures what it means to live. Beautiful, beautiful film, and quite and one that's not actually, uh, in comparison to films like Farewell My Can't Give Nine, it's a piece of Chinese cinema that I hope more people discover. At number 14 is Studio Ghibli's Princess Mononoke. Astonishing piece of animation. You know, it goes without saying, Princess Mononoke is a fantastic fantasy action thriller. It really is. It's got such a gritty texture that you don't see in many animated films. In fact, it's kind of the first to... Well, it's not the first. I mean, there's plenty of films that, that have done that before, but um, it just does it with such a adult tone. It surprises me to see it's a PG. For some reason I, I thought it was like a 12 or a 15. Um, parental guidance, yeah, and it's quite violent, not just so much because there's a bit of blood in it, but it's pretty grim, the themes and everything that go along with it. But yeah, Princess Mononoke, beautiful, beautiful film. And then in number 13 is a film that is kind of, you know, I consider a masterpiece just because of how much it means to me. And it's Toy Story. And just something to throw in about ratings and stuff, you know, while a film like Eight and a Half, for instance, I have beneath Toy Story, it's just because this film just meant so much to me as a kid, and it's just one that'll always have a place in my heart. Because, I mean, obviously, if you're saying, what's the better film? Of course it's Eight and a Half. Of course it's fucking Eight and a Half. But this film, to me, personally, is a favourite. Then at number 12 is Edward Scissorhands, and that is definitely a film that I... You know, it's, it's, I don't know why I don't own it in Blu-ray yet, but I am going to try and pick it up on Steelbook or something. But Edward Scissorhands, again, will always hold a place in my heart. And it's definitely a film that I feel like I'm going to do an analysis of soon because I think it would be nice to share just how much I see in that film and just how much it means to me and how I relate it to it. Because, wow, it's just a, a beautiful film. The cinematography is gorgeous. Uh, the music's wonderful. The characters, the acting is, is really well done. And just what the story sa says and represents. It's really well done. The framing, compositions, the way things are constructed in that film shows that Tim Burton, you know, is a good filmmaker. And it's one of his finest. It's his finest. I think it's his best film still. And the fact that that's like his third or fourth film 26 years ago, you know, he's been, he went downhill. <laughs> but yeah, Edward Scissorhands. And then I have a shitty copy of Fight Club here for number. Number 11, it's uh, it's one of those ones that come in a collection. Yeah, it's terrible. This is one I should own on Blu-ray by now. Uh, but Fight Club, brilliant film, great acting. Again, I just love its subtext, its metaphors, its you know, political, social messages that you know have more relevance now than even in the 90s. It'll always be relevant. Then at number 10 is a film that I just recently uh, re-watched and got on Blu-ray. And the steelbook is amazing. I'm just going to show you the side of it. I'm just going to show you a little bit of it. It's a great steelbook. I think we'll have to do a review and really show it off. Uh, because it's one of the coolest editions I've ever seen. I'll show you the back. You know, there's the back cover. It's it's such a cool release. I think it's probably my favourite just because of how funny it is on the front. But yeah. Boogie Nights is a film that you tell someone about. And they're just going to say... What? Because it doesn't sound like a good film. You know, you say, oh yeah, it's about this kid who uh, ends up being a porn star and becomes really successful and, and stuff. And it's two and a half hours, and it just, it's so much more than just this film about the porn industry. It's a real dissection of how people communicate with one another um, in terms of social grouping. Because they're almost, not, not like a cult, but they're like a family. They are like a family, the way they interact with each other. And there's almost, like, something pleasant about it, and how casually they talk about sex. So, it just goes somewhere that would make most people uncomfortable and it does it in a way that's not you know deliberately trying to be disgusting because it's not often you know there's times when it could just dive right into showing you lots of sex and it doesn't so for that it's a really great film and it's not just about all the sex and everything it's about the characters and about this environment so yeah boogie nights masterpiece then we're getting into my uh, well that's top 10 now uh, number nine is gonna have to be good films from Martin Scorsese a film that can be rewatched over and over with constant enjoyment. Uh, Goodfellas goes without saying, it's a masterpiece. Highly enjoyable film. In at number 8 is The Truman Show. Love this film also. This one is full subtext too. I think this is just one that 
my appreciation and love for it grows over time, and it's one that I, I just love rewatching because uh, Jim, Jim Carrey's just such a wonderful character in this, and it's just so well directed. It's a very, very clever film. And at number seven, we have another great film from Martin Scorsese, which I consider like an extended version of Goodfellas always, and that is Casino. I'm not really sure which I love more, really. I mean, it's very hard to come to terms with these sort of things, but Casino is brilliant. It's three hours long, and it doesn't feel like it. It's wonderfully dramatic. And at number six is Life is Beautiful. This is a film I've seen twice. It's not easy to rewatch. Beautiful, beautiful filmmaking here. Life is beautiful and is a beautiful film. The acting is terrific. The story is so poignant and relatable. I mean, I say that it's relatable. I mean, the sense that you really feel the environment they're in and you can't help but care for them. I think the structure of the film is just really well done to ease you into that because you see where he came from, what he had, what was at stake, what 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 he would then lose. And for that, it's an astonishing piece of work. Beautiful film. I mean, if you don't cry or at least shed a tear during that film, or at least feel something, you're probably not human. No, I mean that. You're not human. Anyway, let's now dig into the top five. Um, number five is another Mike Lee film, and it's Secrets and Lies, which I don't have with me right now. I give it to a friend because, wow, that film just gobsmacked by the drama in that film. Again, uh, it, what, like Life is Sweet, it has you know some very, not dark humour, but, what do you say, not, bl not black comedy and not dark humour, but a very, very cynical moments, and then you kind of laugh out of relief. And its characters are so realistic, and the drama, I mean, it's almost like Douglas Sirk level melodrama, in a modern context, and somehow it feels so real, even though some of the things that are happening are so huge in emotion, but that's just that build-up of huge emotion really works, because the film is all about what happens when you hold things out, and you don't confront things up front, and it's all about family, and it's about love, fucking brilliant film, it really is, I hope more people see that, that's one that, you know, I'm surprised I only saw it now, great movie. And then at number four, another film that I do own on Blu-ray, and you know most people probably from seeing my uh, hour-long discussion of, and that is Farewell My Concubine, a Chinese epic covering 50 years. Brilliant film. Don't know if I should say much more on it since I've talked so much about it in my documentary and, and then also uh, in the discussion. So great, great work, and I hope more people check that one out too. Uh, number three is going to be Magnolia. Or the Blu-ray go for Magnolia. Okay, I don't know what the fuck. I do own Magnolia and I did pull it. Oh, there it is. There. I lost my. Number three is Magnolia. I love this film. There's a lot of people that really don't like the ending and just this film in general. Now, the ending really, really threw me off on the first viewing while I still thought the film was a masterpiece. And thinking about the ending now, it's a completely inexpressible moment. It is a little silly in a way, but... It's just one of the, it's a very strange moment. It's it's something when it happens, you can't really contextualize what it, what its significance is. It, it's hard to explain. You just feel it. It's just a moment that happens, and they're all tied together, and it's really a film that is about life and death and suffering and happiness and and joy and it's just got all these different characters, young and old, and it's really encapsulating uh, all these different stories and how they're kind of interconnected. And I think it does it in such a, a beautiful way. Because the pacing of the film is so constant. You're constantly entranced by its, by its environment, its characters. They're small performances at times. Because really, like, the screen time between all the characters is very little. But great, great work. And I think Tom Cruise in this film is extremely exceptional. And it proves what can happen with a good director. Uh, Tom Cruise, we know, is very hit and miss. A lot of people really don't like his acting. But in that film... He plays a great character who uh, he just has just so much built up emotion that comes out in just a really massive moment. And I thought his acting was great. In at number two is Schindler's List. Another film about the Holocaust that is extremely difficult to watch. One that I've only seen twice in four years, four and a half years maybe. And it's one that I just, it's a burden to rewatch it, but it's such a masterpiece. And it's one that 
I think it's really good to have people watch just to remind them what can happen in the world and not to let it happen again in that sense it's a very educational film and other than that it's just great drama it really is then in a number one is a film that I just absolutely fucking love and it's American Beauty it's hilarious it's extremely sad it's cynical sarcastic just flat out great it's just got so many profound moments and that's probably one I would love to do an analysis of too because the cinematography, the framing, the excellently written script, which is expected because it's written by Alan Ball, he would go on to do uh, Six Feet Under, which is a masterpiece television show on its own. American Beauty though, you know, I absolutely love it. It's just one of those films where everything tied in so well, the great acting, the great cinematography, great music. And if you haven't seen American Beauty, get out there and fucking do it. And I'll not bother doing any uh, honourable mentions this time. And this is a video, I wish I'd get these top videos shorter than they end up being, but here it is. That is my top 25 favourite films from the 90s. So stay tuned for the 80s and then, of course, the 70s, which will be an even bigger video because it's hard to pick just 10 or 25 films from the 70s because I love it that much. So until next time, everyone, thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe, check out the other lists, check out my other videos, and I'll see you next time.